Many moons ago, Ted and I did a video on the five things that we hate about the piano industry. One of the finer points that has been talked about a lot in the comments section is exclusive dealerships. Today, we look at that as a topic and consider the downfall of the piano store. Hi, this is Ted with Alamo Music Center in downtown San Antonio, Texas. I'm Patrick Marr. You can find us online at alamomusic.com. Make sure to check out our new website. It's called alamopianogalleries.com. It highlights our nine stores around the country and has our available inventory ranging from new to used pianos. Check it out and come see us at one of our locations. We'd love to say hi and talk to you about all things piano. Ted, the piano fact. A murder of crows. A choir of strings. There is a colloquial term, I guess, <laughs> an arrangement. So as you move from the bass section of your piano to the, the upper treble range, you get, it starts off, it's usually one big long string, and that goes for, what, 13, 14 strings, maybe more? No, probably about five or six. Okay. A single strong. And then it goes double? <laughs> no, it actually goes up like an octave or so, and then it goes double to two strings that are so wrapped. So two, two strings that are wrapped. Mm -hmm. Some, now, those vary on piano mm -hmm. based on scale and design yeah. and how big. And then it goes to the three. Some of them are wrapped or some of them, but the three is in together, called, you taught me, has, has a group name. And it's called a choir of strings. And my response was a murder of crows. So that's our, it, our piano fact for today is, you know, at some point someone was like, what do we call these three strings that are ring, ringing in unison? Murder of crows. A choir of oh. strings. So that's our piano fact for the day. Uh, Ted, so... You've been in the piano industry for a long time. Uh, when did this, you know, this very strong narrative of exclusivity when it comes to a manufacturer? Oh, we're the Yamaha store. We're the Kawhi store. We're the Baldwin store. When did? Because back in the day, a lot of the piano store would carry multiple. You know, you'd right. have your, your Lowry organs. You'd have your Baldwin well, pianos. You'd have Chickering in the back. You'd have Yamaha. You'd have Kawhi. Steinway would be on the stage and around. So when did this narrative of we're, we're now like the automobile industry. I'll tell you what, these industries, all of them, mm -hmm. from the great age of uh, uh, me mechanics and manufacturing, from the mid-19th century forward, the last 120 years has been a refinement of what's defined as rattling the spoon in the gruel pot, advertising. Mm -hmm. Okay, And what advertising didn't really come on full steam until the invention of a brand name. And there's a past piano fact I had where I talked about that pianos were the first item that people recognized brand recognition. Like in their home. In right? their home. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, uh, Kanabi and it was Steinway. Because it predates it, was, it predates a lot of appliances. It, it predates automobiles. Automobiles. Okay. So, we, you know, believe it or not, there was a time where we didn't have branding all over everything. Everything was made, custom made, custom made, custom made. There's a tailor. Made. But by the time pianos come around, there's, but ours is a Steinway. That's the first brand recognition. Or, well, I have an Erard from Europe, which is what this guy mm -hmm. played. Or or this guy played. Right. So all of these names start coming up as brand names for piano. That's the first item recognized. Since then, we have cars, blah, blah, blah. Now, let's go back to pianos. In the 60s, you went to a piano store, they usually sold everything. Mm -hmm. uh, you could find Steinways next to new Yamahas that were the new Japanese import pianos, and Kawhi's trailed behind them a few years. When I first moved to San Antonio in the late 70s, this store sold a number of different brands. And by the late 80s, they sold Kawhi, they sold Yamaha, they sold Steinway, and they were told almost by all three of those manufacturers, they had to let the others go. So... Was Baldwin like that too? Baldwin was not like that. Okay. Uh, to, to my knowledge, no. Mm -hmm. Baldwin didn't care because they knew one thing. We'll put our piano up against anyone. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, their grand pianos, their, the SD and the SF10 were just phenomenal mm -hmm. instruments. But and even they their had uprights, the, that, the even their uprights, the Oh, yeah. They, they're just, everyone would, would gravitate well, this towards... Well, this is a, another thing, is the piano was the first item that was so expensive for the household, it was bought on time plants. I think the next thing after that were singer were singer solar machines and mm -hmm. then automobiles and a few other things after that. But, of course, mortgages and home property. But 
Uh, piano was brand recognition. Now it's almost like brand so recognized can't be caught in the same store together with the other guy. There was a time where you couldn't sell a Kawhi piano unless it was next to a Yamaha because people were going into the stores in the, in the early 70s to look at these Yamaha pianos mm -hmm. that people were playing on albums and jazz guys were using on recordings and, and, and live and there would be a Kawhi sitting there and that was the competing product out of Japan for Yamaha so they offered it and a lot of people have forgotten this Kawhi at one time was significantly like 20 to 27 percent less expensive than Yamaha of the same thing mm -hmm. uh, five foot six foot however mm -hmm. you arranged them and that brand identification that all things piano under one roof, all things automobile under one roof soon started the more manufacturers got more precision into what they were doing mm -hmm. to the point to where it's like, hey, we're Steinway. You sell all, us or you sell no one else brand well, new. In our, in, our, in our recital hall over there, there's a, there's a wall where the, the, two, the two rooms used to be separated. Well, they used to be the same room and now there's a wall between the two because the first initiative was, hey, you can't put them in the same room. Right. And so this was, you know, the writing was on the wall that, hey, you're going to have to choose, you're going to have to pick, you're going to have to, we're going exclusive, we're going to have a Yamaha dealer, we're going to have a Steinway dealer, right. you know, and so everybody kind of was like. Chevy, Pontiac, mm -hmm. uh, Chrysler, they all split up, and, even and, they had their separate dealerships. And what is the, what are the issues with that product? So there, there's benefits to that from a manufacturer standpoint, and I think, you know, the downfall of the piano store in my mind is that you know the down the downfall of like an independent dealer almost and uh and you know pianos will always be pianos and there'll be a market for acoustic instruments but as you begin to completely associate one location with one brand it it, it shortens the length of customer to manufacturer which isn't a bad thing necessarily but, no not necessarily but but it, it definitely uh in the modern age we're so used to hey if i'm interested in a pair of nike shoes i'm gonna go to nike's website you know maybe you'll buy them from amazon maybe you'll go to a shoe store try them on but we're becoming more and more accustomed to dealing personally with the manufacturer yeah but you're talking about exclusive lines mm -hmm. you mentioned nike Let's say you bought $200 Nike shoes and they're Michael Jordans. That's a type they use. Mm -hmm. And then there's also a $10 Michael Jordan Converse if he didn't exclusively sign with that dealership. Mm -hmm. So you have in yourself making your own com competing products. That's why the idea behind exclusive is we're the only ones that have a patent for this. We're the only ones that manufacture well, this product. And so, so people come to you for that reason. The dealership is supposed to take those direct communication lines from the customer and, and manufacturer and pass those savings directly on to the consumer. Mm -hmm. That's what it says in their advertising. And, right? and, and you know, and for, for more or less, the, like you, you had spoken to me about this earlier, but it's, it's a store adopting the narrative of the manufacturer and saying, hey, we want everybody to showcase this piano first and then talk about hybrid instruments and then talk about digital instruments and then bring them back around. And, you know, there's, there's a game plan for everybody. And so the dangers of that, I, I, I feel like, are, you know, there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of trust that goes into making a purchasing decision. Mm -hmm. And the less options that a store has to be the least confident the consumer is in purchasing. Yeah, things. yeah, it, it becomes it becomes a like a, a smoke a smoke and mirrors game yeah, a little bit, and and specifically with, uh, you know, pianos are they're not a commodity. You know, they're they're chosen for educational purposes. They're chosen as a luxury good. They're chosen as for these other reasons. That, but no one is going to live or die because they have a piano or not, and you know. Their pe consumers have options. Well, it's not a high revolving commodity that people buy on a repetitive basis but, in their life, like a car or refrigerator or, but or whatever. People have out. options, and you know what we've seen is with territories and with dealerships. There's a lot of you have to come in to try this. I need to give you my whole explanation on the whole line before I can give you a price. There's a whole bunch of jumping through hoops. And what we've seen is consumers don't want to play that game. You know, like for a, for a certain extent, if you're like, I want to get a Yamaha or I want a Kawhi or I want a Steinway, you go to those stores, you check it out. You've either, you know, drank a little bit of Kool-Aid with it already or you're about to drink a, try to be served a big glass of Kool-Aid. Uh, but uh, 
cust consumers will go to the market and they'll go online and they'll do research and they'll watch videos, hopefully. Here's, here's part of the dealer problem. The manufacturer dealer network has this communication internal problem. And I experienced this almost 30 years ago. I had a customer come in and wanted to buy at the time. It was a C3 piano. And then when he came in and played, he decided he wanted the next uh, the C6. And he wanted it in satin. And he didn't live around here, but he was in a story. He lived in the Northwest. I couldn't make that sale mm -hmm. from here because that's a, another dealer's protected t territory. And I sat down there, and this is even after talking mm -hmm. to your grandpa. And he was running those, we, we, we'll be in trouble. I get on the phone and I call the dealership up there in Seattle. I'm a salesman. You know what a salesman do? They make deals. I'm going to sell you a lead. Hey, who's the guy in charge over there? Who's the guy that worries about pay, the payroll and the inventory? I got that guy on the phone and said, hey, I'm a salesman over here. I'm sell I, just, I can sell a guy a piano for this price. Can you deliver it? Can, I, can you just like take half of that sale? And the guy goes, you mean you're going to sell a C3 at this price? And like I get, it's my customer, and I just give up. I said, "That's it." The guy goes, "Done deal." I hung up. Try to do that in this day and age. One store you call, not a store that that is in our network outside, and say, "Hey, I got a customer for a GX7 or whatever it is, and it's sold at this amount, and you need to get it and deliver it, and you pick up your end of the commission as a result." That doesn't happen. They argue. They want full commission. They want the whole sale. It's in my dealer network. They, they're going to argue and flex their muscles about their rights when they didn't have a customer for there in the first place, even though the guy lived well, down the street. Why? I think we're getting no into, trust. We're no, getting, no, this is yeah. the real thing. Yeah. It's the product. It's the manufacturer's product that drives exclusively. And I told you this. The other thing about having the, the great thing, I know you want to run the downside of, yeah. of uh, um, product lines, but... When you go there, you're supposed to get the manufacturer's display of how a salesman puts on his show to win you over on that product and from that dealer shop to buy to purchase from them. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they go places, they like the product, they don't like the sales guy, they go someplace else. Mm -hmm. That happens a lot. Yeah, and, and usually in these territories, there's one store location that you have to deal do business with. And it's just, it, it from what I've heard, from people who bought from us, people who haven't bought from us, it's it's it rubs them the wrong way, and so I, you know, we sympathize for because, that. Well, they feel that. like they're being forced to mm -hmm. pay a certain amount from a certain guy, otherwise they don't get the product. And in this day and age, that just pisses people off. It There's does. no other it way does. around it. And so you know, and so this, you know, we wanted to highlight this conversation just because it does seem like. There is a danger to the the living all in one piano store with just one manufacturer, and a lot of stores will carry a lot of used product and 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 as the as the alternative. Hey, we carry these, and this is why. Um, so we just wanted to you know put a warning out there. It it it's it's not a bad thing. No, it's not a it, bad but thing. But it, it could be the eventual. Yeah. I, I the writing's on the wall that consumers don't like playing games if they want a product and they want to pay a price for it. <laughs> And they want to be able to, to go get a competitive price somewhere. Yeah, it's... but people also need to realize that every aspect of their life involves, I said it from the beginning, advertising and lack of confidence and gaining, gaining confidence in a manufacturer and someone to represent it. And so along with that is you get non-advertising propaganda. People are, I never heard of these piano. Are they really that good? And I go, look. It's the premier piano of Japan. It says so right there. Mm -hmm. It says it on their sign. And someone says, well, they just marketed that. Well, yeah. So what? No one's complained about it. No one's challenged them. Mm -hmm. It's been an accepted thing for how long now? They said it, and there are other piano manufacturers. And they want to back that, it up. They're, yeah. they're, they, no one's contested them. They didn't go to court and arm wrestle. Mm -hmm. the, you know, so every manufacturer does that. Number one truck. Yeah. Best best in Texas. What what are all these things? They're manufacturers stealing a limelight to win you over so you buy from them. And and I don't mean to be facetious, but it really is like that. No, and I, I, I hear you. And I I just know that the modern the modern buyer doesn't buy a lot of the the, the brainwashing marketing that has been around for a hundred years. Um, 
And so, you know, that, that's just our take on this. The, uh, you know, the, the exclusivity, the dealer territories, all that stuff is a very frustrating process. If you've had issues with it, please leave comments. We'd love to start a discussion. Um, please give us a call and talk to us about it because, you know, we hear you out. And we've tried to think of solutions for a lot of this stuff. Um, and we work on it all the time because we, we, you know, we see that the piano, the piano world needs to continue to be a, a great, you know, they're, they're community centers for teachers, for students, for education, for universities. And the more we're able to, the fun places. And the more we're able to nourish that, the, the better. And so, uh, please leave comments. Let us know um, your experiences with seeing an exclusive dealer. Being, you know, I had to go to the Steinway store for X, Y, or Z. We'd love to hear those stories. Again, please give us a call as well. You can talk to us, and we can, uh, you know, give give some more stories and some more wisdom on it. Uh, thank you guys for watching, Ted Barslu. I'm Patrick Marr here in San Antonio, Texas, at Alamo Music. Again, you can find us online at alamomusic.com or you can check out our new website, Alamo Piano Galleries, where you can check out one of our nine store locations and available inventory there. Um, and we'll see you guys next time.